Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Lily Meyer. I'm the events manager at Politics and Pros, where we feel deeply lucky to get to do events in partnership with Six and I. It's just a joy to be able to bring authors to this beautiful space, and an extra joy to be able to bring back authors who've been here before. Which I'll get to. And most of the events that we do are for books that are just coming out. Maybe it's the first week of sales, maybe it's the first month. But tonight we're doing something completely different. We're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the publication of Tuesdays with Maury, which is one of the most beloved books of the past several decades. All of my co-workers have told me I remember exactly where I was when Tuesdays with Maury came out. I know where I live. I know what I was doing with my life at that moment. It's that kind of book. In a recent interview, Mitch Adam told the New York Times he likes to read books about people who find their way, even stumbling, to a better place. Which, of course, is exactly the kind of book that Tuesdays with Maury is. Maury is, of course, Maury Schwartz, Alvin's beloved Brandeis professor, and the guidance he gave Alvin has led hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of readers to clarity over the past 20 years. Since he wrote Tuesday with Maury, Alvin has published six more books, including The Five People You Meet in Heaven and The Magic Strings of Frank Rebecca. He's a journalist, he's a radio host, he's a playwright, a musician. He operates nine charities in Detroit and an orphanage in Haiti. He's writing more about the children who've gotten to know there. But luckily for us, he's still happy to talk about Maury Schwartz. And even more luckily, tonight he'll be joined on stage by somebody else who talked at length with Maury. As the anchor of ABC's Nightline, Ted Koppel devoted three broadcasts to conversation with Maury. Mitch Alba happened to see one of them, channel surfing, which prompted him to call his former professor, and which, of course, is what brought us all here today. So thank you all for being here, and please join me to welcome Mitch Album and Ted Koppel. To the Uh, 
I think the first one was on a Friday night, wasn't it? The first one? I had uh, long since lost touch with Maury, who had been, uh, you know, for those of you who haven't read the book, or, uh, been a favorite professor of mine. I had no business losing touch with him. I took every class he offered. I majored in sociology, basically, because it would have been a shame to waste all the credits that I had with him. And uh, I promised him on graduation day that I would stay in touch. He said, promise. I said, I promise. He said, say it in a sentence. I said, OK, I promise I'll stay in touch. And then I didn't. I, I broke that promise every day and week and month and year for 16 years while I did what probably some of you at least have done with your old college professors. You know, you, you forget them because that was a different time of your life and you're ambitious and everything is about your career. And then I happened to flick on the television and uh, I saw more. I, 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 th I don't even know if I was in the room. I think I heard Maury Schwartz. I think you opened by saying, who is Maury Schwartz? I don't mean to do a Ted Combo impersonation. <laughs> It just flows naturally, you know. <laughs> Who is Maury Schwartz and why after tonight are so many of you going to care about him? I think that's you said pretty much what you said. And uh, I said, Maury Schwartz. And then I, I looked at the TV and Maury... Was Actually, like, the, the line was something like the most famous person you've never heard of. Mm. And that was your Maury. Yeah, and uh, except it wasn't my Maury. He was uh, gaunt and white-haired, and that wasn't the more that I remembered. His voice was, and the way he spoke was, and then I realized he's dying. I heard the story, I watched it. And then I went through this whole internal examination of well, what do you do when you've lost touch with somebody like that. And um, one story that did not get into the book, I don't know why, uh, was the first phone call that I actually made to Maury after I saw him on your show. And, uh, you know, I was trying to get the guts up to make a call. And all I was going to do was make one phone call. I, I'd like to say that I had planned to go visit him every Tuesday and learn everything there was about life and all the right, right from the beginning. I wasn't. I was very selfish and ambitious at that point and didn't have time for anybody much more than myself. And I got up the courage to make one of those phone calls where you hang up a couple times before you actually get through. And when I was in college, I used to call Maury Coach. I don't know why. It was a sports affectation or whatever. And when I called him, uh, his nurse gave him the phone, I remember. And I heard him say, hello, you know, with that high-pitched voice. And I said, Professor Schwartz, I was really formal. Professor Schwartz, this is Mitch Album. I was a student of yours in the 70s. I don't know if you remember me. And the first thing he said to me after 16 years, the actual first words were, how come you didn't call me coach? You know, and uh, yeah, I'm... Needless to say, by the end of the conversation, I was coming to visit him. Guilt is a very powerful motivator. <laughs> and that's really what did it all there. But everything that followed was accidental. And, uh, you know, one visit wasn't supposed to be more than one. Then it turned to two. It wasn't supposed to be more than two. Then every Tuesday and after that for a while. And uh, I, I, I think I remember, I don't even know if I met you. If I did, it was the third one. And I remember talking to Maury at one point about your coming back to do a second and a third one. And I didn't like it, I have to admit. Uh, I said, they're using you. And he goes, I'm using them. And, uh, you know, and, and that was the end of that. I've, very, of course, since changed my opinion about that. But, uh, you know, I, I was very protective of Maury. I didn't have the right to be, but... but um, what you did with those programs can never be measured. And they're they are seen, and I think, at least for many years, ABC made them available for schools, and they were studied, and they've been around the world. And uh, in 90 minutes, you really captured an awful lot of him. Um, is there anybody here who is not familiar with ALS, who does not you know, you can't really tell the story of Maury without also talking about the impact of ALS. It's a dreadful, dreadful disease. Uh, it is sort of the mirror image of Alzheimer's. With Alzheimer's, you know, the body remains intact and the mind goes. With ALS, the mind remains intact and the muscles go. And Eventually, you know, first the extremities go, and eventually the, the voice goes, and the ability to swallow goes. 
It is a terrible, terrible. It doesn't death. always go in that order either. You, you, you might have not had two more visits with Maury if it had just gone in the order that I've seen it go in many other people where they lose their voice first and can still move around and walk around but can't talk. Maury was blessed in that way because he was such a talker and he once said to me, I, he, he talked about taking his life in a theoretical sense. He never, I think in the end, didn't want to, I think he said he wouldn't do it because of the, it would scare his family. But I said, well, what would push you to the edge? And he said, um, if I couldn't communicate anymore because that's who I am, you know, I, I need to communicate. And, and God at least granted him his voice literally to the end. I mean, I talked to Maury, my last conversation with him, which he always says was the, was the most meaningful one, um, was two days before he died. And most ALS patients don't have a chance to do that. But uh, I'm curious, because Ted and I have become more friendly over the years, um, much more than during that process. I really didn't get to know you very much during that process. In fact, the first time I think I met you so I don't think it was at the house the third time you came, was at the funeral, where you agreed to come and to speak, but only, and I want to give Ted credit for this, only if they wouldn't announce it or make a thing over it, uh, because Ted didn't want to take away from the family and, 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 the, and the thing. And so nobody knew that Ted was going to say anything. And then he came and, and he spoke, and we sat next, they put us next to each other. And, uh, and that's when we got to know each other. But um, between the first one and the second one, the second one and the third one, um, I mean, I was just curious about your, I was seeing him every week, but when you don't see somebody for a couple of months and then you're about to go back and that thing is, so how far have they fallen and what am I going to have to do to lift up the interview? Did that go through your mind? Yeah, you know, Lori's, Lori's spirit was so extraordinary. I don't know if he ever did this. I'm sure you do. But he talked to me at one point about, he said he really hated the idea of not being able to attend his own memorial service. Well, he had one. Yes. And, and so he, I mean, what he talked about to me, and you can fill in the, the gap, he said, I want to be laid out on the kitchen table. And I want a bunch of lilies. He said, I want to hold the lilies. And then I want all, all my good friends and family members to come and tell me what a terrific human being. <laughs> did, he, did he ever go? Well, minus the lilies, yes. And minus the table, he did do that. Uh, he had everybody gather for a living funeral. And, uh, you know, everyone spoke about the deceased in glowing terms. But then at the end, the deceased was able to stand up and thank everybody who came to the <laughs> funeral. So. Uh, yeah, he did do that, and I've since heard many people have um, done the same. Uh, and it is true. I mean, why, why miss out on all the you know nice things that everybody says? I don't know what happens when we die, despite the fact that I've written a lot of books about heaven. But you know, to hedge your bets against what if you can't actually attend your own funeral, it, w it would be nice to, to have that ahead of time. And he did, and it was a beautiful ceremony, and he got to hear lovely things said about him. But more importantly, he got a chance to say them back. And Maury would refer to ALS as my horrible, wonderful disease. Horrible slash wonderful disease. And any time I run into, and run into isn't the right phrase, I am contacted by endless, endless numbers of people who have ALS or who have a relative who has ALS. Can you speak to them? Can you get to talk to them? Can you come visit them? I've developed a lot of relationships with people who have ALS as a result of that, some, some very good friendships even. Uh, with uh, There's a guy named Augie Nieto out in the West Coast, who some of you may know, he owned, started Life Fitness, those bicycles that you all use in the gyms, at the hotels and uh, health clubs. Well, the guy who invented that, super fitness, super everything, discovered he had ALS when he was 47 years old and he was water skiing in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam and uh, kept falling off his skis and came back home and they said, you have ALS and, and, and tried to kill himself and all kinds of things. And then since has just taken a different twist and he has dedicated his life to finding a cure for it using business acumen and running, he runs this whole organization, Augie's Quest, like a business. They pay people top dollar, the researchers, the whole thing, and it's all, their, their profit is finding the cure for ALS and they've made amazing strides. Uh, and he lives out in California and, and he and I have become very good friends. Um, but uh, 
when he referred to Maury as horrible, wonderful, and this is why I, I try to tell newly diagnosed people with ALS, it's about the only positive thing I can say. Horrible because of all the obvious. The, you lose, it snips the connection between your brain and your, the rest of your body. So it's a neurological disease, and, and eventually your brain is just not sending signals to the rest of your body, and this is why your body becomes this husk, essentially. Uh, and, but as Ted said, your mind stays perfectly intact. But the wonderful part is it's gradual. And so instead of getting hit by a truck and, oh, I didn't get a chance, you have the time to say everything you wanted to say, to tell everybody how much you love them, to tell how much everybody the things you want to share with them, to have a living funeral if you want to. And, and in that regard, I thought Moria was remarkable because he could use the word wonderful with a terminal illness. But uh, talk about what, what really made Maury unique, which is, I suspect that most people with ALS withdraw into their innermost circle. And what was so extraordinary about Maury is that he kept wanting to expand the circle. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he wanted to get the word out. Anybody who's ever been an important part of my life, come and say, come and talk to me. Yeah. Come and, come and tell me how much you love me. Yeah. Uh, he, he really wanted to hear that. Well, there were a couple, there were a couple of, I think, milestone moments that led to that for Maury. One, and I base this obviously on the things that Maury told me. So one was when he was diagnosed. When he was diagnosed, he was in the doctor's office, and um, he had been going for eight months trying to figure out why he kept falling down and all these things. And finally, the doctor told him, you have ALS. And, you know, he said, well, that you, I remember Maury said to the doctor, that used to be fatal, right? It's not fatal anymore, because he was associating with Lou Gehrig, because he actually remembered Lou Gehrig. And the doctor said, no, it's still fatal. And, and he said, how long do I have to left to live? Maybe two years. And Maury went outside, and it was apparently a very nice day. Uh, and Maury said that he went outside and he looked around, and the sky was blue, and everything that had been nice when he went into the doctor's office was still nice when he came out. But he was a man living, expecting to live a long life when he went in, and was a man with a two-year death sentence when he came out. And he said, I stood on the steps of that building, and I, I expected the world to change. I, I couldn't understand why the sky didn't get gray, and everybody didn't stop playing Frisbee, and everybody didn't fall off their bicycles or whatever they were doing in front of him. And um, he said, don't you all know what just happened to me in there? Isn't the whole world supposed to come and say to me, no more laughter, no more enjoying ourselves. We're all going to be somber now. The world will be somber because you got a death sentence. And he sort of waited for that to happen, and it didn't happen because, as Maury said, the world cannot cater to one individual. It was the kind of phrase that he and, would use. And when you talk about Maury losing all of his physical capability, describe for Maury Schwartz you knew he would be a professor. I mean, first of all, he was this elf, yeah. tiny little man. But, but, well, he, he wasn't a leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could see him. He didn't need a magnifying glass to find him, but I, I, I'm a little suspicious because I'm rather close to his height. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. I mean, you and I are not exactly Wayne Johnson no, or Rock either, either, but my wife says we're the hobbits of, of the. Uh, but, well, Maury was, he was, he was an elfin, but he was also um, very into movement and dance and body movement and everything. He, he would literally dance around. And uh, he would, this was in the 70s in Brandeis University, you know, when he was teaching sociology, they would actually do those trust exercises, you know, where you had to stand and fall backwards and get caught. And he would do it with us. He would, you know, close his eyes and, make us catch him, you know, which I thought was really, if you didn't get a good grade, you were taking your chances on that as far as a professor is concerned. But um, he would go dancing on Wednesday nights uh, to this church in Harvard Square. They had a thing called Dance Free where you would pay five bucks, and, which I also never understood. If it's called Dance Free, why are you paying five bucks? For? But he would go in with like a towel, and he would just, he wouldn't tell anybody who he was. He'd go by himself, and he would just dance 
around. He'd do the rumba and the merengue, you know, even though we're, they were playing rock and roll music and he would still do this kind of stuff. He loved movement, loved it. You know, he would do yoga. He, 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 so for him to lose use of his body and the ability to hug even, which was I mean, massive to him, that was, that was very strong for him. But he decided on those steps. That was the one moment he said, well, I have a choice. I can either go south and just be angry the rest of my life, or I'm going to have to find something positive in this deal. And the positive thing that he found was that he had always been a teacher. And so he looked at every subject, especially in sociology, as a teachable subject. And he decided death would be a teachable subject. And it, it appealed to him because he said, well, everybody's going to die. So I'll just go first. And they'll ask me, you know, and I'll, I'll yell back. Here's what's happening, here's what's happening, here's what's happening as I'm going, you know, and they, uh, I think he likened it to everybody wants to ask me, I'm on the last great journey and everyone wants to know what I'm packing, you know, and that's the way that he phrased it. And so I think he delighted actually as time went on in teaching a subject that was unique to his circumstance. It wasn't book-based. He didn't have to cite Eric Erickson or any of the other people and sociologists that he used to love to quote. He, he cited himself, and um, I think that's what got him through. If he had not been a teacher, I don't know that would have come so naturally to him, but that's why he did not withdraw. And you're right, many ALS, you know, I, it would be foolish and wrong to assume that everyone who gets ALS somehow has a Maury Schwartz moment and then just becomes this soft, wonderful source of knowledge. There are some people who are very bitter about it, right? to the end and, and, and really feel gypped. But, um, but I have seen other mores, maybe not as profound, maybe not as verbose, but I have seen other mores with ALS where something kicks in and it's like you just let go. So, okay, I can't worry about my career anymore. There is no career anymore. I can't worry about the house payment. It's gonna have to find a way to get taken care of. I can't, I can't, and, and all you can do is relate to human beings as they're in front of you, and in many cases, love them. There is something that's transcultural about Maury's story. And uh, this book has been translated into how many different languages? Uh, I mean, just about almost 50 languages, yeah. 50? Yeah, almost 50, 48 and, languages. And what, 20 million copies of the uh, book? It's about 18 million. 18 million and the movie, and the stage production. I mean, just talk about the, the phenomenon of the Maury story, but I'd like you to bring it back to the transcultural point. What is it that makes the story of Maury Schwartz as accessible to an audience in Japan as it is here in the United States? Well, it's funny you ask me about Japan because uh, when the book came out, it was a bit of a, of a controversy in Japan, because uh, in Japan, it is not common practice to tell an older dying person that they have a, a uh, terminal illness. The proper thing is, if you get diagnosed like that at an older age, the doctor just says some equivalent of, go home and rest, you know, get, get, you know, get your life taken care of, and it's just understood, but you never speak about it. And when I went to Japan for the first time with Tuesdays with Mori, I got asked that everywhere I went. You mean to say that Mori was told that he was dying? The doctors told him and that he knew and he told other people that he was dying. He didn't mind sharing that. And I said, no, he didn't. And they were, they were riveted by that. So, and yet, it's a huge bestseller in Japan. It's taught in the school systems there. I'm constantly getting requests, can, can we excerpt these lines for school books? From, more from Japan than any place else, although also China and, and other odd, odd places. Why was it universally embraced? First of all, it wasn't my writing, and I have never kidded myself about being that, that way. There's a funny story about the actual, I mean, the book Tuesdays with Maury was only written to pay Maury's medical expenses, and I don't know if he ever mentioned this to you, but um, when I asked him, what do you fear the most with your death? I was just expecting an answer of, you know, I'll choke to death. That's mainly how ALS people go. You know, they can't breathe. I'm afraid of, and he didn't say anything like that. He said, I'm afraid of the death that I'm going to leave my family. I'm afraid of they're going to die. I'm going to die twice. 
And I said, what do you mean by dying twice? He said, I'm going to die the first time. That's going to be horrible. And then we don't have the money to pay off all these medical bills, and they're going to have to sell the house and do these other things. And I'm going to cause, you know, it's like a second death all over again. That's what he was afraid of. And that was the motivation for the book, Tuesdays with Maury. Not the visits, but the book. You know, as I, I said to myself, well, I have to try to help him. What can I do? The only thing I knew how to do was write. And I started to go around to publishers in New York without Maury knowing it, um, asking them if they would be interested in, in a book like this. And the truth of it is, almost all of them said no. Not the slightest bit interested. You know, boring, depressing, you're a sports writer, what do you know about it? There was a, one publisher who I won't mention because could have relatives here, I don't know which. But um, he actually stopped me in the middle of my explanation and said, I'm not, stop, don't waste your time. I don't even think you know what a memoir is. Come, come back in 20 years and maybe you'll have something to say. And um, I remember that because I remember leaving with my, my literary agent was with me and I, I was like in tears. And I said, why can't they just say no <laughs> politely, you know? <laughs> they have to like tell you you're worthless. Um, and I probably would not have pursued it. I mean, that's how many no's we got. I probably would have thought, this is just a bad idea had I not kind of in my mind pledged that I had to find a way to make a certain amount of dollars that he needed. I knew what he needed, I knew exactly what he needed, and that's what we asked for. And um, it was only really a few weeks before Maury died that we found Doubleday was interested in publishing it and they, they agreed to do it. So um, the book itself was not supposed to be. Then the contract for the book was a 300 page book. That's what the contract said. I had never worked under that kind of a condition before. And in those days, you know, it was 1995. I was using a Tandy, you know, 100 little computer or a typewriter much of the time. And I just, I triple spaced it, whatever you do, you know. And, and it came up to 300 pages. And I thought that's, a, you know. And uh, I tried to just, I had one rule in writing Tuesdays with Maury. And that was don't overdo it. And that was the only rule that guided me. I said, this, I know this story is special enough don't try to show off with your writing. And every time I thought I was inventing a flowery phrase or a new way to describe the horror of dying or dealing with death, I took it out. And that's why it ended up as short as it did. And when I turned it in, they called me about a week later and they said, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? They said, the book's supposed to be 300 pages. I said, yeah. They said, well, we typeset this and it's gonna be about 160 pages. And I said, well, that's all I got, you know. He, he does die at the end, you know. It's, I can't really extend it out, you know. It's not Game of Thrones. So um, that, honestly, I know it sounds silly, but that's why the book is as small as it is. You know, it came out, it was a little book. Well, they, they made it small because it, there weren't enough pages. If they made it big, it would have looked like a comic book. So all of these things, we're not supposed to be, you know, and they printed 20,000 copies and they thought that will be it. It's not, you know, never gonna sell more than 20,000 copies. And they didn't like to reprint it. It was, you know, when, when, when they started to get like a buzz, like people were talking about, they were very hesitant. I always joke that they reprinted it in quantities of eight. You know, like, <laughs> when, when we went from 20,000 to eight, 20,016, 20,024. If you ever look at Tuesdays or more, it says it's in, it's like 200 and something printing, but, the first 150 of them were eight at a time, so it's not impressive. So it grew organically. It, did, it came out in August, which is a terrible time for a book to come out, especially one that's you know, meaningful. Usually, you know, the summer is for thrillers or things like that. It came out in August, just lay there, and then people started to read it and pass it around. It did not get to the bestsellers list until uh, November, and then at the very, very bottom, and it didn't go to the number one position on the bestsellers list until the following April, which if you know anything about the book business, that's unheard of. I mean, nothing sticks around that long, you know, especially when you start so low. So it was really word of mouth. It was people who were passing around. How long on the list? Four years. It was four years, almost four years at number one on the list. And so, uh, you know, it dipped here and there, but for the most part, uh, yeah, it was like 200 something weeks. I couldn't have predicted that. Nobody could have predicted that. And I know it wasn't my writing. It was just, it struck a chord with the students of the world, you know, who, and, and the people who had loved ones who died, you know, be they grandparents or parents or whatever, and those who were going to have to face that themselves at one point. 
Talk a little more about that court, though. What my question initially was, what do you think it is that transcends all national, ethnic, religious boundaries? Why was the story of Maury? Why did Maury, and he would, he would love the notion of being described as a phenomenon, but why did Maury become a phenomenon? Because, um, well, it's a three-pronged answer. One, everyone has had a teacher. Everyone has had a teacher. No one goes through this life without somebody who taught them. It doesn't have to be a real teacher. It could be a grandparent. It could be your boxing coach. It could be whatever. But somebody has had that teacher-student relationship. That's universal. That's the same in Cameroon as it is here. Number two, uh, everybody would like to know what really matters at the end. And I always felt that the best use of Tuesdays with Maury would be read what Maury said matters at the end and then apply it now. And everyone is looking for that little thing. Uh, and the third part was that not everybody, but a good part of the population, especially younger people, they see themselves in me in that book. Not me personally, but that character. Going a thousand miles an hour, doing a lot of things, not, not satisfied, not understanding why you're not satisfied. Everything seems to be the way it's supposed to be going, and yet you're not finding anything. And I think we all wish that we had suddenly that, that Cinderella, you know, the, the guardian the angels that come down and take care of her and give her the answers. I had Maury to say to me, you want to know why you're not as satisfied as you think you should be, I'm going to tell you. And um, I think that that's universal. I think that those three prongs can be found in most countries in the world, most societies in the world. And um, that's probably why, even translated, it, it's found such an audience. Let me point out, we've got a couple of microphones here in the, in the front of the auditorium. Uh, and in a couple of minutes, we're going to go to your questions. And what I'd like you to do, please, uh, not more than three or four at a time, uh, if you would just get up and stand behind the mic, and then we'll, we'll run through as quickly as possible. And my real job here is to keep your questions short. Um, may, may I ask you a question? And I do that ruthlessly. Yes, go ahead. So I wondered, how did Maury affect Well, I guess the best way I can answer that is to say he was sort of a time-release capsule. Um, and when I, when I left Nightline in 2005, um, I decided instead of doing one of these programs where you do the best of, or uh, as a friend of mine likes to describe, books by journalists, they all ought to have the same title. Famous people who had known me. <laughs> so instead of doing that, we ran the Mori program because there was something universal about Mori. Uh, and I just felt that uh, if there was a message to be left uh, in the 25 and a half, 26 years that uh, I was doing that line, in, in many respects, it wasn't all the famous people that I interviewed. Uh, it was this, this quirky little guy uh, outside Boston uh, who inspired the affection and admiration of so many people at the least effective time of his life when he was dying. Um, and, um, you know, Maury kind of sticks with you. He clearly has stuck with you in a big way, but he stuck with me uh, for many, many years, and, and is still there. Um, let's uh, come on up and start asking questions or making observations, or if you have a story that uh, I'm sure Mitch would love to hear about how Maury's tale has affected you. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Robin Goldstein. Thank you so much for this. Um, I have 
kind of a two-part question. Sorry, I'll try to keep it short. So obviously you can see I'm very pregnant and this little guy is coming soon. Could even be as early as this week, if not within the next few weeks. Let, I hope not, because um, I'd really like to stay for the end. Um, as would we. <laughs> um, but very soon, and at the same time, my father is dying. And I actually just found out a little while ago, before I came here tonight, that he has been transferred to hospice care. Um, my parents live in Florida. There's no way that I would be able to get to his funeral, and we expect him to go in the next week or two. So I've known that this is not a surprise. I've known this for a long time, but the timing is obviously far from ideal if there's ever a good time for someone to die. And I'm just wondering, given all of the perspective that you've had over the years about death and dying, how, if you were me, would you rationalize this joyous birth compared to the tragedy of death and that the, my father wants nothing more than to meet his grandson and we know he's not going to. If he does, it'll be electronically at best. Well, first of all, you're giving me too much credit to be able to, I think a rabbi, although we are in a synagogue, right. a rabbi would be more in order. Uh, but what struck me as you told your story is that you already have your answer. Uh, they're not different. They're one and the same. The, as Maury would say, the coming and the going ain't much different than you think. And, uh, you know, the symmetry of life losing someone and gaining someone almost at the same time is, is pretty apparent and beautiful in its own way. Um, sad, of course, what you're saying, you know, because you want everybody to be together. We all want our families to be together, but if we had that, our great-grandparents would all still be here with their great-great-great-grandchildren. Um, so I would, you know, you know, because he told this story on your one of your episodes, and he told it to me, honest to God, every week. And, and I would say, Moy, I know how this ends, and he would still tell me anyhow. There are two waves flapping around in the ocean. They're having a great time, they're flapping, they're flipping, and all of a sudden, one starts to panic. What's wrong, says one wave. Look, the shore. Yeah, you don't understand. We only got a couple flips left, and then we're gonna hit the shore. This is terrible, we're not gonna exist anymore. Uh, the wave says, no, you don't understand. You're not a wave, you're part of the ocean. Then Maury would look at me and say, you get it, part of the ocean. I said, I got it last week, <laughs> got it the week before, got it on Ted's program, got it every time you told the story. But it is a beautiful story. And, and there is something in there in your particular situation about, you know, everything that your father put in you is in you. And everything that's in you is going to be in your child. So everything that's in you was from your father is in your child. And so one way it breaks, I'm gonna start crying, so I can't have anyone go any further. It's too late for me now. You know, that's me, the way I would look at it. Let me add something to that. There, a part of the Yom Kippur liturgy is a, a story that is told of a question. And the question that is raised is if we could have eternal life, no more death. Everybody gets to live forever. But the cost of that would be that no more babies are born. Is that a bargain that we would strike? And the answer, of course, is no way. No way. We, we require the rejuvenation of life. And the deal that we make is we old geezers have to go and then the young children take our place. Go ahead, sir. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Hi, Rich. Um, I'm, I'm Akash, I'm from the UK. Um, you used to be a sports writer for some American sports. Um, and 
then he met when you reconnected with Maury, you wrote this book, and now you don't write about sports, you write about life and time and death. I, I guess, what was the flip that made you go from sports to sort of sticking with this theme, and what are you learning as you're writing more and more about it? Well, I still do cover sports. I don't do it anywhere near on, on, the, on the basis I do for a newspaper where I live. But I, you're right, I don't write sports books anymore. I stopped writing sports books after Tuesdays with Maury. The simplest way I can put it is this. When I was a sports writer only, people would stop me who would recognize me in airports, you know, from the TV I did or things like that. And they would ask me questions, and the questions would always be, hey, who's going to win the Super Bowl? And I would just keep walking, but I'd say, Patriots, you know, and I'd just keep going. And it was fine. They were happy. Yeah, yeah, that's all I want. And then after Tuesdays with Maury, people who wouldn't recognize me from television or something would stop me, and they'd, but they would say, my mother just died from cancer, and the last thing we did was read your book out loud together. Can, can I talk to you about it? And you can't say, Patriots, and just keep going. <laughs> and so... This happened to me, it's not an exaggeration to say a daily basis. Any time I went out, it still does. After a while, you realize that this is really what life is about. This is what people are much more interested in. And this is what I ended up being more consumed by. And so you write what sort of is in your wheelhouse. And, and um, it's not like sports became insignificant. I don't want to insult sports that way. It's a part of life, the same way as business, politics. You know, Ted was joking in the, in the, in the room before saying, why don't we just go out and talk about Trump? I said, really? You know, <laughs> why, why would that be more important than Maury? It's not. But for me, I could see the difference between the two. And, and um, I have become fascinated with trying to learn what Maury tried to teach me. And I emphasize the word trying because it's an ongoing effort. And that's why my, my books have stayed in that category. Thank you. Hi, Mitch. Hi, Ted. My name is Andrea, and I also went to Brandeis. Um, I also went to your high school, Akiba. But uh, stop following me around. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to Brandeis. I also had Maury as a professor. I took one class with him called Group Process, which was awesome. One of the best classes I took there, and I found him to be such an unconventional teacher. Um, and what really stood out for me was he really listened more than he talked. So my question for you is, what was so inspirational to you about Maury that you can share with this audience as a professor at Brandeis? Um, the very first time I met Maury, uh, I had signed up for his class ahead of time. You know, when you're a high schooler, you pre-sign up. So I had signed up for some introductory sociology class. I walked into the room having pre-signed up for it, and there were nine kids in the classroom, I remember, because I looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, I could count them. And I, I wanted to cut the class, I wanted to leave, because I said, you know, if I come in here, it's way too small, if I cut it, they'll know I'm not here, you know, this is not. So I was actually uh, turned around and, and, and was kind of sliding away out the door to go to the registrar to drop the class. You could do that for your first two weeks, I don't know if they, when you were there, but you could. And he called Roll. He started calling Roll. And I heard him call Mitchell Album, because when your last name begins with A, you're always screwed. And, <laughs> and uh, I literally, and I've said this many times, I could have kept walking, because he didn't know who Mitchell Album was. So I could have kept walking and dropped the class, and I would not be sitting here with you now, and my life would not be anywhere near what it is. I mean, it would be totally unrecognizable if I had just kept walking. So, you know that movie Sliding Doors and that whole concept of this? Well, I lived it. I mean, I was a few steps away from a totally different life. And instead, I slid back in because I'm Jewish, so I'm always guilty. And, uh, <laughs> and I raised my hand and I said, here, and he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell, which do you prefer? This is the first thing he said to me in my life. Is it Mitch or Mitchell, which do you prefer? So, I have one of those names that any year people can call you Mitchy or Mitchell or Mitchell. Or so. I said, uh, well, Mitch, my friends call me Mitch. He said, Mitch it is. And Mitch, I said, yes. He said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question. <laughs> but uh, 
Um, that was the small, I, this is the best example I can give you. From that point, everything was like that with him. And you know, that group process class, I don't know if he did it with you, but one time we came in and he just didn't talk. Yeah. Did he try that one? First class. Yeah. yeah, he just sat there and he just, <laughs> like this, and he did that for like 20 minutes or whatever, and you know, and people were so uncomfortable. And then he finally he said in this really soft voice, "What's going on here?" And and he proceeded this whole talk about why people are uncomfortable with silence and why nobody can stand silence, you know. So he was cool, you know, and he took a he took a personal interest in me. He once said to me, um, after he had gotten to know me well, he said something in Yiddish, you know, that sounded like And I, I said, what does that mean? And he said, you hide your light under a bushel. That's how it translated. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you don't let people see the best part of you. You almost go out of your way to make yourself not as likable. And he said, and you remind me of somebody. And I said, who? He said, me. And so that was kind of our connection. So all those things are the answer to your question. Thank you so much. Sure. So you mentioned many of your conversations with Maury, but earlier you referenced that your last conversation with him was your most meaningful. Can you tell us a little bit about what was shared and why, why you categorized it? I can tell you the whole thing. It didn't last very long. Um, Maury was in bed, which in and of itself, as you know, Ted, um, Maury hated being in bed. It, I think he said to you one of his aphorisms was, when you're in bed, you're dead. And so he insisted on being carried out every morning to his office. And on that Tuesday, what turned out to be the last one, um, I came down to his office and the chair was empty. So I, I thought, like, I just opened the door and went in, you know, people didn't let me in. I thought something had happened to him. And then I came back a few steps to where his bedroom was and I saw this little lump in the bed and it was little, I mean, Maury at the end, he was small to begin with, but there was so little left of him that under the covers, he looked like it was a little boy. And it was up to his head, the covers were up to his head, I guess he was cold, and uh, he held, he asked if he could hold my hand, and, um, and he said, I want to ask you a favor. And he didn't say it as strongly as I'm saying it, his voice was very weak, but he said, I want to ask you a favor. This was the whole conversation. And I said, what, what's the favor? He said, after I'm dead, I want you to come visit me at my grave. And I said, okay, I was going to do that anyhow. And then he made it a joke. He said, not the way everybody else comes. Don't come and leave your car running and get out and put down flowers. Come when you have some time. Bring a blanket, bring some sandwiches. <laughs> and I want you to talk to me. Tell me about your life, your problems. Tell me about the Red Sox. And I remember, you know, I was trying to always make him laugh because that was the way I dealt with, I dealt with the horror of it. I said, "Okay, <clears throat> you want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone, and talk to the air?" And he said, "Just like we're talking now." And I said, "It won't be like we're talking now because you won't be able to talk back." And basically, the last thing he said to me was, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk, I'll listen. <laughs> and that was about it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we said a few things. I, I think I, my last words to him was, I'm going to see you next week, and I expect that you will be in better condition. This is not acceptable, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he said, okay, but that was the last lesson. It was a very short conversation. And the reason I say that that is the, the most important thing is because that's the essence of the whole thing with Maury. You talk, I'll listen, you know. I've always said, you, if you lead a life like Maury did with people and making memories for people, giving yourself to people, then when you die, you're not really gone and they can talk to you, not because of ghosts or seances, but because you put your memory inside them, and they can hear your voice, you know, so when you say things, oh, if mom were here, she'd say this about that water, you know, if dad were here and he saw you with an iPad, you know, well, why, why do you think you know what he would say or she would say? Because they spent time putting their voice inside you. But if you don't take that time, if you're always too busy, and you're always on the run, and you don't make those memories, and when you're gone, you're really dead. You're really gone. And so uh, that was the essence of the 
whole thing. That's how death ends a life, but not a relationship. You've got to have that relationship while you're here. All right, let's see if this works. I'll try to keep it short. I know Ted, you just, your job is to keep them short here, but I actually just graduated from college, and so I have a similar relationship where I had a professor where I took every class uh, and have tried to maintain a relationship with him, especially after reading the book. So beyond you know, reading the book and taking the lessons from more and keeping in touch, what are some things now, as I start to see high school and college kids who are getting older and I start to be more of a teacher than a student, what are some lessons that you think, uh, that you learned from more that you could pass on to someone that is making that transition like myself? You mean at your age? Yeah. Um, well, in the interest of speed, I'll, I'll just pick one. Um, don't buy the culture. You remember that he said that to you, and he said it very often. Maury said that so many people in this world, in this country, walk around like they're sleepwalking because they buy into the values that the culture has told them they need. You've got to have this kind of job. You've got to have this kind of car. You've got to have this kind of thing. And, and then they just all of a sudden find themselves in their 30s and 40s and 50s just like, in a daze, and next thing you know, they wake up and they're at the end of their life and they say, what did I do, where did it go? I think for today's kids coming out of school, like you are, or people your age, there is so much out there now that the culture is telling you you need to be from the digital age. You know, we didn't have to deal with this kind of thing. We didn't have to deal with, you know, not, we had to deal with, okay, you have to have a job and you have to make money and you have to be responsible. We didn't have to deal with, you have to have a high Facebook profile, you have to have 150,000 followers, you have to have all this kind of stuff that like, you're a failure if you don't. Well, there's a million ways now in this country that you're a failure if you don't, according to everybody on the web. And so I think Maury's thing about if you don't like the culture, just don't buy it, don't buy into it. That would be probably the first thing that come to mind for young people today because you're going to make a choice early on as to what you're going to pursue and what your values are going to be and if you let it be guided by society versus your heart you might find yourself conflicted. Go ahead. Yeah, I, um, you mentioned that everybody has a teacher and I was fortunate to have one like that um, and he convinced me to get out of journalism and teach. Now this is going to get to my own Maury story. Okay. So my last year of teaching, I had the class, uh, teachers called in the class from hell. There was nothing you could do about it. I, I took it by design. There was no controlling them. I had 25 years experience. I thought I was a good teacher. And uh, I just decided I, I had to do something. So I brought Tuesdays with Maury in on Tuesday to read it. And of course, the first day they pay no attention, you know, which is pretty normal. The next Tuesday, I said, I'm going to try it again and read it again. And a couple people started listening. And again, you take no credit for writing, so I take no credit for, for writing the book. This is all about Maury. And by about the third class, a student came up and said, that's a pretty good book. I like that. Did, did he write anything else? I said, no, Mitch Album's not that good. Just stay with, you know, stay with Tuesdays with Maury. <laughs> Just kidding. I love your sports stuff. I read it all the time. <laughs> then you come along, and by about the fifth class, people now are starting to hit the other people. I said, be quiet. Listen to this. And maybe seven weeks in, the kids started asking, can tomorrow be Tuesday too? And I've never had a book like that. I mean, you can talk about Shakespeare, you can talk about those kinds of things. So that's the power of that. The question I want to ask, though, is this, and it's not facetious. Maury teaches us so much. And right now, our country seems uh, a little divided, perhaps. And if the spirit of Maury suddenly materialized, oh, say in D.C., say in Let's make it 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, it's kind of a scrooge kind of thing. What message would he want to tell the president today? And again, you can't speak for us, but I'm both of you take because you don't too. What do you think he might say? Um, if not to the president, to Americans? What do you well, think? he'd probably begin by throwing up. But <laughs> then, <laughs> then he would, he would, you know, Maury wasn't apolitical. He was not apolitical. Maury had some very strong political opinions. Maury was kind of socialist in his mentality. You know, he thought, I think he once maybe told you, I, I never remember, you know, it runs together. Did, did, he, did I see it on your program first? Did he tell it to me? Did he tell it to me and tell it to you? But once he said, no one should have more than a million dollars. I remember he said that. 
No, you can't possibly need more than a million dollars. So anyone who has more than a million dollars should just give it back, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, of course, that was 95. It's probably up that number a little bit now, but no one should have more than $1.2 million. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a big hypothetical. But I imagine, the, if, if, to, to try to seriously answer your question, he would say, be human. That's what Maury... You know, if you really want to, you really want to breach the divide of anything in life between peoples, whether it's a religious war or a political divide or whatever, or an age gap, just remind everybody that they're all the same in the end. And he, he loved that phrase, we're all more alike than different. We are all more alike than different. But when he would watch, he rarely watched television, more. So I can remember like three times that I saw him do it. And he was watching once some kind of conflict, whatever was going on in the world, and they were showing footage from a battlefield. Of people being, and he started to cry, just cry. And I said, why, why are you crying so bad? Do you, have you ever, you've been there? Do you know, no. You know people there? No. And I don't think he even knew what country it was. I said, why are you crying? He said, because when you are about to die, you feel the pain of, of everybody in the world who's suffering so much more acutely than when you're healthy. I think he would try to deliver that message in some kind of way that it could be absorbed. You know, you have a responsibility in this job to, to remind everybody, uh, pull people together because we're all human and you're doing the exact opposite, you know? So wake up, you know, something like that. Right. I don't know. Thank you. Sure. Thank you both for, for coming. My question is both deeply unfair and eerily similar to the one that gentleman just asked. Um, but this book struck a chord with me when I was 17 years old uh, for the same reasons I'm a huge Springsteen fan. There's just something innately human about it. Um, and like this gentleman uh, uh, noted, it's a really tough time for humanity. Uh, and so I'd ask you, Mr. Album, in all of your years discussing the book and meeting people and, um, you know, kind of just basking in its impact, what, what would your one takeaway or kind of your one message to human, humankind be about the things you learned from Maury and the things you've kind of, you know, uniquely been able to experience as the author of this book and, um, the, you know, the guy who made this all happen. Sorry, it's eerily similar. Um, <laughs> again, deeply unfair. Yeah, I, um, it, it's a little probably too, too big a question for me to answer. I don't, you know, I, sometimes people will come up to me and say, Maury, I just want to tell you, and I have to stop and I said, I'm not Maury. <laughs> I was the stupid one, remember? <laughs> and uh, I feel like I'm just Maury's eternal graduate student. And maybe Maury would be able to answer that question with a singular thing, but I think anything I said would seem almost weak. Uh, I'm not done learning yet. I'm still... My eyes are open all the time. Um, and I, even at this age, uh, feel like a student all the time. I will tell you that there is something, a big part of my life in the last seven years since the earthquake in Haiti has been children. I have an orphanage in Haiti. I'm there every month. And there is something about children that has become such a dominant factor in my life as I get older and as I am more and more turned off by the world. I'm more and more enraptured by children. And uh, I, I do believe that we have a huge obligation to the children of this world to not let them make our mistakes. And I find myself telling our kids in Haiti, I've got 47 kids, and I say it in Creole, or I say it in English, and almost all the time when I talk to them, I'm telling them about a mistake that I made that they shouldn't make. Uh, and I, I think you know, if you really want to have a future of the world, we need to make sure that, you know, again, we may not be able to do a lot about what we've done, but we got to make sure that the ones coming up don't just stumble into the same thing. We appreciate that, Ambassador. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, um, my name's Olivia. My question's kind of personal, and you don't have to answer it, but I would really just give anything to sit down with you and pick your brain, and this is kind of as close as I can get. Um, so what was the one moment in your life where you have felt closest to God, and what was the experience? Uh, 
And remember, God is listening. <laughs> Um, well, it wasn't a good one. Uh, I, uh, the last two years of our lives, my wife and I had one of our children from Haiti living with us, a little girl named Chica, who was five years old when we brought her up, diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. And, um, we were able to get her out of Haiti, and we, uh, I didn't know. I thought if she would come up and, and, and we'd just have a, uh, an operation and then we'd be able to take her back. As it turned out, when they operated, they discovered that it was called D something called DIPG, which I wouldn't wish on the worst person in the world. And uh, it's totally uncurable. And just the same, we thought that we would be the ones to you know, somehow figure it out. And something that was supposed to take her in five months, she, she battled through for 23 months. And... We took her all over the world, and, and, and she was the little girl that we never had. And my wife and I got married late, and we didn't have kids of our own. Um, and when it finally took its toll on her, and she, the last couple of months of her life, this uh, joyous, precious package, you know, who was always challenging us and always laughing and always dancing and singing, and, you know, it, 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 it wiped her out, and she would lie in this bed right next to the bed where my wife and I sleep inches apart. And, uh, and uh, she wore this monitor on her finger that, that monitored her pulse blood oxygen. And in the middle of the night, my eyes would open and I would look at those digits to see if they were where they needed to be. And many times I'd have to wake up and my wife and we'd have to resuscitate her or get her going again, put tubes down. I'll spare you all the details, but... Um, in the last hours of her life, I remember having a real battle with God. And, and, and she just lay there so innocently, and her heartbeat was just dwindling, you know, 12 to 10 to 8, and, you know, we could count it. And I was so furious and so angry with God, um, and uh, I could not understand why he would let this happen. At the same time... Um, that was probably the closest I was with God because I was in a one-on-one -on -one battle. And uh, I realized, as someone wise had once told me earlier in my life, that it's better to have something you believe in that you can argue with than to think there's nothing there at all and this is all shit. It's all meaningless. It's all whatever and all that. And, and in hindsight, I, I guess I was glad that I had some place to turn that I believed in and, and say why than to just look around and have nothing. And so, sad to say, it's probably not the answer you expect, but the closest I ever felt was when I was really arguing. I'm still mad, but, um, but as my wife often says, aren't you happy that you believe that she's someplace where you'll see her again or she's with her the mother who died when she was born and all that. And I said, yeah. So I think that was probably it. Thank you. Is that a personal <laughs> enough answer? <laughs> no, it was very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Elisa, and I'm actually, I guess, one of those Just people. pull the microphone oh, down. Uh, my name is Elisa. I'm, I'm one of those people. I just reread it because um, a friend of mine died recently, and I'm kind of in a job crisis. I'm a lawyer. So one of my questions was, uh, you don't have to answer this one. We're like limited to one question, but one of them was, why didn't Maury like lawyers? I was curious. Why didn't Maury like what? Why didn't Maury like lawyers? Because I mean, DC is full of lawyers. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but the, the but my main question was um, what I was thinking about when I was reading the book was, um, I feel like I don't know if it's just Americans, but I think we're um, kind of you know, like you mentioned Facebook and social media, it's like we have a very difficult time dealing with um, sad feelings or like, you know, everything is like up, 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 you know, our movies have to have a happy ending and all this. And so one of the things I think I was really interested in that Maury said was um, like experiencing like his um, negative emotions fully. And I was wondering if we could really get into that because, um, I don't know, maybe um, 
we didn't need help with that. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for bringing that. It's, it's a point that I think is important in the book that doesn't often get raised in discussions or things like that. But Maury, and I think he told you this too, Ted, you know, Maury didn't wake up like, hey, I've got ALS, no big deal. You know, it wasn't like that. Maury was enraged, Maury was sad, Maury was depressed, Maury went through all of that. And what he said was, don't fight those emotions because you're not going to win anyhow. Lie back and let them go through you. He would wake up every morning and he would give himself 45 minutes. He said it was the morning he was the angriest because he would dream that he could still move. And his dreams, in his dreams, he wasn't in a chair. So when he woke up, it was that harsh reality of like, no, I, I have ALS, no, I'm dying. So he would cry. He would wail, he would cry, he would scream, why me, why all the rest of it, but he put a limit on it. He gave himself 45 minutes to just howl at the moon, and then he said, that's it. That's self-pity. That's what that feels like. I know what it feels like, now I'm putting a lid on it. Same thing with depression, same thing with terror, same thing with happiness, same thing. He wanted to know what each emotion was. And what, he said by recognizing it and saying, that's what it feels like to be enraged. That's what it feels like to feel uh, something unfair has happened to you. That's what it feels like to be joyous. You could recognize all the emotions and, allow, and not be afraid of them when they were coming, but also recognize that they don't last forever. You know, There's that famous story about the, the king who comes to a, a, guy, a, a guy who says, I want you to make me a piece of, I want you to make me something that makes me happy when I'm sad and sad when I'm happy, you know, balance. And if you do it, I'll give you my whole king. If not, I'm going to cut your head off. And he gives him a day and he, he prays, he prays. And finally, the guy, king comes back and he, and he gives him a ring. And on the ring are the words that say, this too will pass. And, and it's to say, you know, that's what Maury was trying to, you know, experience, that there is no one emotion that stays with you forever. You can't be happy all day long, but you can't be depressed all day long. And um, allow yourself to experience all of those emotions, and you'll be able to take them for what they're worth. And I just wanted to say, also, after reading your book, I think one of the things I was kind of motivated to do was to write a memoir about my mother, because she's getting older, and I think it would be nice to thank you for that. Good luck. They can't treat you any worse than they did me when I first went out. So. <laughs> but later, I'll tell you which publisher to avoid, because... <laughs> Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing, Nick? Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Mr. Koppel. I have uh, fell asleep. I, I grew up in many small apartments, and we fell asleep, and my dad watched you religiously. So I fell asleep to your voice. You have no idea how many times. <laughs> so, is that how many? You have no idea how many people fell asleep to my voice. That's actually a compliment, believe it or not. You know, one of the reasons that I, I read the news and, and to segue into uh, Mr. Album. And then every Sunday morning watching the sports reporters. I grew up playing sports, still watch sports. Well, one night, uh, a movie came on, a TV movie called The Five People You Mean Heaven, You Might Know It. <laughs> and, uh, and it just, you know, you catch a movie in the middle of it, and I start watching it, and I'm like, and I was at a point in my life where uh, I went to many funerals. My, my dad was older, I lost my father, and lost many people. I, went, I, I always said I went to more funerals than I went to weddings. I watched, I, and I watched, and then I went to, I had no idea with you. And I, I, I used to read your, your sports reporting, I used, used to read the Detroit Free Press, I was a Tigers fan, and then all of a sudden, I, I get the book, it's Mitch Album. And then further on, I read One More Day. This is after, <clears throat> after I lost my father. And uh, I, gotta, I gotta acknowledge that that was one of the things that helped me get through it. So thank you for that. My question is, one of the things you wrote at the beginning of the book is like life's greatest lesson. Since we don't have sports reporters no more, <laughs> and it's a great show, uh, in the form of a parting shot, could you tell me what life's greatest lesson is? <laughs> I was told there would be no math on the exam. <laughs> Can you take this one, Ted? <laughs> um, life's greatest lesson so far to me 
is the majesty of being able to exist in a life where sadness and agony mix so incredibly beautifully with joy and, and happiness and satisfaction. And you know that they're all out there. And it's possible to experience the absolute best of this world and this life if you search for it. And yet it's a really tough trip. And some days you get closer and some days you just stumble. But if you're blessed to be able to get up the next day, you get to try again. And there is something, as I get older, that makes me appreciate the beauty of this world and its possibilities that I didn't when I was younger. And I see it in children, as I mentioned before, but I also see it in, in, in other elements, and I see it in nature, and I see it in, in the world. And I, I do believe that when I was taught in religious school as a kid, you know, why is there evil? Why is there, why do bad things happen? All the rest of it. And if you got to ask God one question, wouldn't it be, you know, why do you let us suffer and all the rest? And that God would answer, I gave you all the tools. They're all there. But I never said I was going to figure it out for you. That's what you're there for. And honestly, as, as I get older, I believe that that's true. I think we have the capacity as human beings to make the most incredible existence or the most awful. And life and the meaning of it is the choices that you make along the way that lead you to one or the other. Did I finish in 60 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one thing before you ask your last question? Because Ted's very efficient and he may wrap up right after you do. Um, I feel very awkward talking as much as I have here in the presence of this gentleman. First of all, there is no Tuesdays with Maury without Ted Koppel or Richard Harris. But, you know, I'm getting way too much credit for this. Um, even if I wrote every word of Tuesdays with Maury exactly the same as, as I did, I never kid myself that it would ever have reached as many people or even close to as many people if Ted had not done three programs, had not told, was it Rune at the time, was in charge, had not said to Rune Arledge, well, I want to do this story about a dying old man, even though it's depressing and even though it's all the rest of that stuff. You know, before I showed even a, an ounce of interest in Maury, Ted showed courage and Ted showed uh, passion and Ted showed interest in another human being story that precluded and, 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 and in every way uh, preceded what I did. So while my conversation may have dominated this evening, it shouldn't in the big understanding of Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah, that's very, very nice of you. Um, I I don't think you realize what an enormous responsibility <laughs> you have. This, this better be a really, really good one. Uh, well, firstly, um, my name's Daniel. I'm uh, from Australia, and uh, on behalf of everyone here, um, a huge heartfelt thanks uh, for tonight because, you know, the words are often loosely used, but I truly regard it as a great honour. Uh, to be here this evening um, uh, listening to you. And uh, firstly, I should say that also that honour is felt all the more forcibly um, because I'm 36 years old, but uh, I was 16 years old when I read uh, this book. And um, uh, at that time, would you believe, uh, every Tuesday my grandfather would come over for dinner. And I remember reading your book, and uh, as a result of that, it really ignited, um, triggered some um, beautiful wonderful conversations that money can't put a price tag on. And um, he passed away three years later. And I'm quite sure had um, I not read the book, um, those conversations would never have taken place. And those conversations with him uh, stay with me forever. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I guess it's a sort of nice bookend. My question is the one that you actually asked uh, Ted at the start, which is uh, how um, roll the clock forward 20 years from having in this book, um, how um, this book has changed you most.
Well, the short answer is every way possible. Um, I sometimes think of the sliding door version of what if I didn't uh, turn on the television set that night? What if I didn't make that phone call? What if I ended it by saying, well, Maury, good luck. Um, I'm sorry about the news. I never went to visit him. Um, on such small things, you know, your life can turn. A, a decision to make a trip, a decision to make a phone call, and then everything changes. Everything changes. So the entirety of my existence from age 37 to where I am now, 59, is, is largely as a result of, of seeing Maury uh, and then ultimately writing the book about it. First book I ever wrote that wasn't for my own profit and wasn't for my own you know, advancement and, and, and was supposed to be something that I remember asking my literary agent, because it was so opposite of what I was known for, do you think this is going to hurt my sports writing career? I actually <laughs> asked him that. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, um, what if I go into locker rooms now and people say, oh yeah, you read that stupid book you wrote where you cried at the end, you're a little baby, you know. Uh, I had Mike Ditka in mind for some reason. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember my literary agent said, I wouldn't worry about it, nobody's going to read it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from that approach to sitting here in this beautiful building with a man as prestigious as Ted and, and, and hearing all these questions, it's stunning. So from an overall just experiential point of view, my life has been flipped on its end as a result. But more importantly, on a personal level for me, it made me think. It made me stop and it made me think. I would be misrepresenting myself and being far too haughty if I said, oh, I now know the secret of life. I don't. I would be misrepresenting myself if I said, I'm now as smart as Maury. I'm not. I don't know that I ever will be. Um, but what Maury did is what I think all really good teachers do. He got me to start asking questions. And to this day, 22 years later from when I started encountering him, I have even more questions than I did before. And I seek to be a better person. And I say a little prayer in the morning, every morning. It's not long and it's not big religious. It's just, you know, a little quick conversation. And uh, I begin by thanking uh, God for what I've been given. And having been places like Haiti and all that, I, I always say, even getting from my room to the cup of coffee, to sitting here now, I've already had a better existence than everybody in these places that I've been is ever going to have. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. And I end by saying, you know, let me be smarter today than I was yesterday and try to figure something out that I, you know, be better than I was yesterday. And I didn't have any of that, honestly, before I reconnected with Maury. I was really going in a, a very, very selfish direction. And you know, we like to think like there will, somebody will always come along and stop us from going a bad route, but that's not true. Sometimes they don't, and sometimes you just zoom like that for your whole life. So I was really the lucky one and the fortunate one, as much as many of you have been kind enough to say, oh, this book helped me, or this book came at a good time. It, it, nothing came as good a time, I don't think, as, as my experience with Maury in terms of it being him being able to change me and my direction and my priorities. And I hope to try to keep, continue to live up to them. And one day I hope to see Maury again. And um, people have asked me after I wrote Five People in Heaven, they always said, Do you, who are your five people, you know? Who would they be? And I always said, well, Maury would be one. What would you ask him? How'd I do? And um, I hope I get to ask him that, and I hope I get a good answer. That's my answer to your question. And thank you, Ted, for coming.